Welcome to my Wednesday webinar at high noon in the Mountain West. Today's webinar focus is the untold story on spinal cord injury. And I'm Dr. Narda Robinson, osteopathic physician and veterinarian. And I am the founder and CEO of CuraCore Vet. And so this untold story series is specifically designed for veterinarians or veterinary students who are going through school and, in my opinion, not learning the full story. And we have taught thousands of veterinarians, medical acupuncture, photomedicine, all these different things. And it turns out they didn't learn these things either. And when I go to visit other veterinary schools and teach, turns out that those students aren't learning anything like this currently. So that leads me to believe that there is an untold story here that I am interested in telling. So the first untold story, we covered scientific integrative medicine for seizure disorders. And so that's what these installments are about. And again, for some of my webinars at large, I also put them on our podcast called Surviving Veterinary Medicine, available through Stitcher and Apple and all the other ones that you typically go to for podcasts so that you can listen to it as well. So I'm going to be reading a lot of the citations that I have here for the podcast purposes. So you can read along with me because if you're on video, then you will see that. But anyway, so today, the untold story about spinal cord injury. This is a lot like, in many ways, the TPLO issue. And why it aggravates me so much is that you have so many different types of approaches that are available and effective and are untold to you as students or were untold to you as veterinarians, and then you never learned it, maybe because there are investments in maintaining the status quo of surgery and various other invasive procedures. And when you think about how does a veterinary teaching hospital survive, they need to make a lot of income. Why would you, as the hospital director, say, well, you know what, you could go for a series of medical acupuncture, photobiomodulation, herbal consultation, medical massage and rehabilitation treatments for, you know, X amount of dollars per week. Or you could come in for a surgery and get at the minimum $5,000. We'll throw in an MRI there. And oh, if there's complications, you come back to us for those as well. Not saying it's all about the money, but as we saw in our other Wednesday webinar on, wait, don't cut. There is a financial investment in having more surgeries by hospital administrators. If you work for corporate, by the corporate bottom line. And then think about it when you are a neurosurgeon, as I once wanted to be and studied to be for human medicine, you have invested many, many years in becoming a neurosurgeon. And you have the trappings and the emotional, physical, mental lifestyle of this is what you do. And not that there can't be neurologists and neurosurgeons that embrace acupuncture, that have put down the knife when possible and are doing integrative medicine and rehab. There's certainly those, and we have had them come through our courses. So good for them. And that's very good. But what I hear from our community is a continued just rebuffing of going to science-based integrative medicine and rehab at the outset, offering that as an immediate option when you have a down dog presenting or even back pain or neck pain. There is the very well-worn rut in the road so that they're on a track. If you go into a vet teaching hospital, likely you'll go into emergency with your dog. So if they're a client or a vet student or a vet, you go into emergency and they take you in and then they talk about MRI and then they talk about surgery. And this happens even in human medicine when we're dealing with the opioid crisis and you go to the ER. It can be 
very well known how bad the opioids are, how quickly you become addicted to them after like five doses or so, you start to build that dependence and how it really shouldn't be a reflexive prescription for opioids when somebody comes in with any kind of pain or like my 80 something year old father, when he went into the emergency room one day, he just had some bronchitis. It's like, oh, here, how many opioids do you want? See, you know, how many days of oxycodone here? I'll give you 30. So it's just ridiculous. But it's because there's these well-worn neurological circuits in physicians and veterinarians that just compel you to have this reflex response of prescribing things because it's just what you do. And for those that have kind of considered, is this really the right thing to do? There is a lot of fear involved. So we're going to go into all that. But that's what this untold story is about. And few, if any, speak about it, which remains untold, therefore. So mm-hmm. our goal for today is actually many goals. Stop telling people that surgery is the only option. Stop telling people that their dog needs to get an MRI and then surgery. So frequently the approach is, well, we're going to do an MRI. Okay, fine. Thank you. I think that's good. You're the boss. You're telling me this. And then we might not wake them up until they're done with surgery because it's just better. You just go from anesthesia, continued anesthesia into the surgery suite. And you scare people by saying, oh, if we wake them up, that would be horrible. Let's just keep them under anesthesia. Not really telling them how bad just all that super prolonged anesthesia is going to do and not giving them the option to say, "Um, I need to think about this. Give me time to call my veterinary acupuncturist, my veterinary rehab people. Let's see what the other options are. No, 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 no. You go under and you stay under until you get out and then we'll see what the outcome is then. We don't know for sure. Talk about that. Stop telling people that they need to use high dose steroids for a long, 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 long time. Stop telling people that it is all about their dog, that acupuncture and laser don't work. We hear that people in academia don't necessarily know the latest information. They don't know where human medicine necessarily has gone. They don't know the evidence and the mechanisms of action of acupuncture, massage, photobiomodulation, even cannabis, even rehab. No, 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 don't do that. This is what you need to do. The research says, well, let's look at what the research says. Stop telling people that strict cage rest is absolutely needed when you can't defend that, when you can't show me one study that says that cage rest, strict cage rest, sticking them in a box for six to eight weeks, only letting them go outside for the bathroom, and then putting them back in there. They'll have mental breakdown. Everybody in the household, especially with COVID, you're all going to have mental breakdowns. Stop telling people to delay rehab, acupuncture, laser, et cetera, until so much damage has been done from the strict cage rest, from the surgery or the no surgery, from the steroids. If your dog is still alive, if they're even still walking, if whatever, if you have any resources left after you had to do another surgery, and so on, that then maybe, okay, maybe you could do some acupuncture and the dog doesn't even know how to walk anymore, has just destroyed the joints because there hasn't been enough weight bearing. Oh, and stop experimentally injuring dog spinal cords to study spinal cord injury. That goes for rats as well. It's a whole different thing to have naturally occurring spinal cord injury where the mechanisms are such that the direction and the force, magnitude, of a disc problem in a dog is way different than you opening their back up experimentally and dropping a weight on their spinal cord. Very, very different, goes for rats as well. We have such an abundance of naturally occurring clinical disease in the canine population that it is unnecessary. We're gonna go into a lot of these issues. So when you feel empowered to be like me, even a homeopathic dose of me, and say, well, wait, do we, uh, let's talk about this more before we even think of surgery. If you even do that, and you want to discuss research, when you do your online free shopping at pubmed.gov, and you're looking for open access articles on on spinal cord injury, on intervertebral disc disease, on photobiomodulation, on medical acupuncture, on electroacupuncture, all these things, even uh, stem cells, which comes up, which I am not a great fan of, But anyway, think about who is writing the paper. Is this a surgery group that has written the paper? What is the research question? Like with TPLO, are they comparing one 
highly, highly invasive anatomy revisionist surgery with another one? Or are they comparing it to fully integrated science-based integrated medicine program with rehabilitation, which nothing like that has been done. So save the time, realize that they haven't compared cruciate to a full blended multimodal integrated medicine approach for cruciate disease or for spinal cord injury. So it's just not there, but feel free to look. Maybe someday it'll appear because there supposedly have been people doing some research, but I haven't seen the papers yet. If there is a comparison, what did the comparison group receive? That will come up here during our talk today. And if they say it's conservative therapy versus surgery, what is conservative therapy? Is that sitting in a box with a high dose of steroids for eight weeks? Is it getting other NSAIDs or getting some NSAIDs instead of surgery? Is it some kind of little bit of rehab? What is it? So what did the comparison group receive? We can't just say surgery versus conservative therapy if you don't know what they did. Even if it was acupuncture, what was it? Where were the points? Did they do electroacupuncture? What was the treatment interval? All these things you have to know. And unfortunately, not all articles are open access. So you may or may not have the ability to look into that further. If you are in vet school, then a lot of times you do have access. So that's great. And take advantage of it while you can. What types of bias or biases do the medical journals have? Some will refuse to publish if they even see the word acupuncture, which is why in the human field, some like Bill Craig of Craig Penns, who characterized his electroacupuncture intervention as percutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, and he got published once he did that. Before that, when he said acupuncture, he was getting refused right and left by these human journals. So there definitely is that. Who is sitting on these editorial boards? Where are the reviewers that they send things to? And what biases do they have? So often unspoken, but clearly a factor in what gets published. And what's the payoff and for whom is it to maintain the status quo and ridicule those that question the old guard? We'll be going into that, but I've already mentioned some of that. So why is it so hard to challenge surgeons? There are inbuilt reasons and just impediments for you to not, you know, why you don't feel empowered. You feel small. You feel like, oh, I'm just a vet student or I'm just an essential worker of somewhere else or I'm a house cleaner or whatever. And here's this big surgeon or a little surgeon, but it's a surgeon. And so you feel intimidated because of that. And you feel they have all the answers and they should be able to tell you, is non-surgery an option? And you're so clearly telling me I need to do surgery and really quickly, you're feeling boxed in and you feel like you have no options because nobody's given you options and you haven't had the wherewithal to study and you just feel disempowered because you're scared. And they make you feel irresponsible if you don't go into that. And I've been tackling this issue for well over a decade. And so I see what goes on and I see how they disavow that this is even an issue at all. And then we see it happen again and I see it repeated all over the country and our people in our acupuncture courses and so on, they deal with it a lot. And they also deal with the pressures to refer for surgeries and to up that bill. So you end up feeling utterly overwhelmed and it's with vets and vet students as well as clients. Just the system is in a way rigged against you. And then you feel stupid for asking, even if you have a veterinary degree, because it's just what is set up. It's that clinical dyad where you are not empowered. So whether you're a vet student, whether you're a client, whoever you are, this is to help you, but it's mainly for the vet student because you're in there. And I want you to see how this unfolds as you are in the clinic, as you're going through school and be able to think, you know, okay, I see what's going on here. I want you to know that. So what's the good news? Well, this would be good news, a basket of kittens. That is very good news, especially if you were hoping one would arrive for you. But aside from that, that's not the good news I have to tell you today. What's the good news is that you are not alone. And so we are here for you. We are educating people every month, every, even every day, because we have people in our online courses learning about spinal cord injury and how to address it in a multimodal integrative fashion. 
So other good news is that not all surgeons rush to cut. And as I said, we we have many graduates from our acupuncture course that are veterinary neurologists and veterinary neurosurgeons. And whether they leave that um, position sometimes and just say, not going to do it, and then whatever the consequences there, you know, that's once they've graduated. So I don't really hear about that as much, but they are really happy to have these options. So anyway, if you don't have surgery, if the dog doesn't have surgery and they tell you mm, that neurological injury is going to last forever and you are responsible and it's your fault and it's morally reprehensible if you don't bring that dog to surgery right now. Okay, well, let's look at some evidence. Humans, lumbar herniated disc, spontaneous regression, Korean Journal of Pain. It's interesting that these two articles I'm going to talk about are from Asia because even we had a person in one of our acupuncture classes who knew of a neurosurgeon at a really, really worldwide famous institution of medical, you know, just one of the big bastions of medicine, and how if you even said anything about a non-surgical approach to back pain and disc disease, I mean, it's like you were so shunned. So uh, this is what I'm talking about. So, but in Asia, they have regularly instituted non-surgical approaches. When I have lectured to human groups about this at meetings and whatnot, it's not unusual for an Asian individual, let's say from China, you know, and they're like, I love this. This is what we do routinely in terms of acupuncture and related techniques for all of our spinal cord injured patients. It's just part of the standard of care. And so we really need to just understand that there are geographic differences. So this from Korean Journal of Pain, lumbar herniated disc, spontaneous regression. It was like, oh no, that must be religious. Oh, it's spontaneous healing, spontaneous elimination of cancer. No, it's where, as we see here, you know, they talk about low back pain, results in substantial disability, causes admission of patients to neurosurgery clinics. And so they wanted to see how therapeutic outcomes work by means of a conservative approach. Now in their thing, they're not even talking about acupuncture, they're talking about bed rest and medical therapy. Bed rest, which even that is not really even standard of care anymore. The, the more advanced people are talking about getting up, doing some exercise, doing massage, doing acupuncture. But anyway, it was a retrospective cohort, neurosurgery departments, hospitals in Korea, different levels. Um, the amount of back pain was, tried to be quantified, all patients. So previously, five patients had received physiotherapy, seven patients had been on medical therapy. You know, how did these people do conservative treatment? All patients reported that they had benefit from the non-surgical treatment. They also had radiologic improvement observed simultaneously on MRI scans. You know, it took a few months, but as they concluded, it should be kept in mind that lumbar disc hernias could regress with medical treatment and rest without surgery, medical treatment and rest without surgery. And there should be an awareness that these patients could recover radiologically. So if you are listening to this on a podcast, just for the citation, Korean Journal of Pain in 2017, lumbar herniated disc spontaneous regression. So that was one study. And they also gone to say that, yeah, if you had an epidural abscess, if you had caught equina syndrome or severe and progressive neurologic deficits, after six weeks of trying conservative therapy, yeah, you might try surgery. But they are saying, of course, try conservative measures first. Here in 2009, Journal of Chinese Medical Association, case report by Chang et al. on the spontaneous regression of lumbar herniated disc. So if it's going to regress, then your cause of wanting to go in and remove it kind of disappears as well. That regresses as well because you're not still having that spinal cord impingement. As they say, intervertebral disc herniation. Now, they're not just talking about back pain, but they're talking about herniation of the lumbar spine is a common disease representing with low back pain and involving nerve root radiculopathy. So you are having neurologic problems as well. And now they can watch the changes with MRI. Many reports have demonstrated that the herniated disc has the potential for spontaneous regression. Oh no, if the disc resolves on its own, our surgeon's going to be out in the street without jobs. Regression coincided with the improvement of associated symptoms. They're still trying to unpack what's the mechanisms, but here we present two cases of lumbar intervertebral disc herniation. I mean, and 
Yeah, it's cases, but this is because there's a lot of people out there that get these things and they never go into the hospital, they never get surgery, and then, oh, okay, they're better. Now, then the question is, how much better would they be if we regularly, as standard of care, instituted electroacupuncture, photobiomodulation, medical massage, certain amount of neuroprotection and anti-inflammation from cannabis and other anti-inflammatory analgesic herbs and appropriate exercise therapy. As I say, in conclusion, many studies have demonstrated that herniated lumbar discs have the ability to spontaneously regress. This phenomenon may be related to dehydration. So the thing, it's just sitting out there. It's not getting anything to juice it up. So it's going to dehydrate. It's going to shrink, retract. And then the inflammation that does develop can help to clean it up. So it makes me think a lot of TPLO and the cranial cruciate issues. And like, let's just surgerize this situation before it heals on its own. Versus the other way to think about it is let's do some nice nourishing treatments that will help it resolve on its own and help those reparative mechanisms work even better so that they don't get stuck along the way. Does this happen in dogs? Oh, look at that. Spontaneous regression of lumbar Hansen type 1 disc extrusion detected with MRI imaging in a dog. So they actually saw that it happened. A three-year-old French bulldog evaluated because of acute signs of back pain and spastic paraparesis. So here's like a down dog, upper motor neuron injury, T3 to L3, MRI evidence of extradural spinal cord compression at the disc space of L3-4. Saw it was a disc without extradural hemorrhage. Dog was treated conservatively, again, with cage rest restricted exercise on a leash and NSAID. So the dog was able to get out, was kept confined. I don't love the cage rest, but I don't see any acupuncture or anything here. And even without that, which would facilitate the resorption, results of follow up examinations five weeks later indicated complete resolution of signs. Five weeks later, complete. Resolution of clinical signs, results of repeated MRI indicated a 69% reduction in the volume of the herniated disc material. What happens if you do surgery? You are cutting into the skin. You are cutting, right? You got to get down deep. So you're cutting into the skin. You are working with the muscles there and moving them. You are ronjuring out bone. That and dealing with ligaments as well and causing who knows how much trauma. You have destabilize that back. Maybe you love that because you're a surgeon, you think that's great. And you should do more of those levels just in case. But the disc could disappear on its own. And then you haven't done all that. So here's the crux of it with the pathophysiology of spinal cord injury. And in the first phase of it, the physiologic changes with the primary phase, and then the secondary phase, the benefits of integrative medicine and rehab versus surgery, you know, are different. And if you don't institute some kind of supportive care, once you get past that initial thing, whether, okay, if you're going to do surgery, whatever, you're going to induce more trauma. But, you know, let's say you do surgery. There is still that secondary phase of spinal cord injury to deal with. And so our plan is to match the mechanisms of photobiomodulation and neuromodulation with acupuncture, et cetera, two mechanisms of spinal cord injury. Because we are scientists at CureCorvia and our community of graduates, we understand what the science-based mechanisms are of the treatments that we employ. And the, in that way, we can say, okay, what's going on here that's broken? How can we fix those specifically? So we can identify ways in which patients with spinal cord injury can benefit so we know the pathophysiologic mechanisms and we know the therapeutic mechanisms. So how big a problem is spinal cord injury? We can also look at the human implications of really perfecting our approaches with the dog because the dogs are even responding, it seems, faster than a human might, but it's still uneven playing field. And here, again, when I've spoken to human either rehab and physical medicine and rehab specialists or acupuncturists or whatever, they say, they see the cases that I present that we've worked on with dogs and they say, that is fantastic, that is mind blowing, that would be enormously wonderful to have, but that seems to take a lot of effort. It seems to take repeated visits. 
we don't know if insurance would cover it. And so they are so constrained by the insurance system that they're in, by the hospital system that they're in, that it's like we as veterinarians can give so much more care in our free freedom of choice way. And even a lot of times doggy insurance will cover it. But it's like just the the problems with health insurance here and even in Canada or wherever are then leading to limitations in what can be done for humans. And so it's just such an opportunity to work with naturally occurring disease and be able to show this is how we repair the spinal cord. And it makes me think, what would happen if some of these high profile individuals with spinal cord injury, like Christopher Reeves or whoever, what if they got the treatment that we're giving to dogs? What if they got that right away? And just how much suffering, how much suicide, how much just death is occurring because things that are readily available, explainable, accessible, otherwise it's like, just come in and we'll work with you, could have been tried. So the scope of, I mean, millions of people are living with spinal cord injury. There's lots of new cases annually. They're usually traumatic. So this is the human. And their rehab is, to me, really limited. It's not fully including everything that we could. For dogs, intervertebral disc disease is the most common spinal cord disorder, spinal disorder, and affects many breeds, mainly the achondroplastic, dischondroplastic types. Adoptions are overrepresented. And so this is where we can translate insights from the dog work to the human. And these academic centers have large caseloads of dogs, and unfortunately, a lot of them get surgery. But we could, with a forward-thinking school, help to change that. And But veterinary clients are often willing to participate, especially if they're going to get a break on the cost, the multi, multi, multi thousands of dollars. And so they, they typically sign up at a rate of 90% or more. And so Levine et al. had mentioned, despite decades of research using experimental models of spinal cord injury to identify candidate therapeutics, there has only been limited progress towards translating beneficial findings to the human spinal cord injury. That's with the experimental model. But here we have so many dogs and we could study them with naturally occurring disease because that's more akin to what happens in the human. So Anyway, the gross and histopathologic lesions are similar between canine disc herniation and some types of human traumatic myelopathy. And then for those of you that have seen me speak about spinal cord injury before, we've seen this dog and just all the myriad problems and complications of spinal cord injury that accrue. There's pain, there's neuropathic pain, somatic pain, musculoskeletal pain, visceral pain, inflammation, cardiac and abdominal complications, paresis, paralysis, urinary and fecal incontinence, then you get skin breakdown. So there's lots of things that go into spinal cord injury. And it's so much beyond that little piece of disc that you're going to carve up the back for. And then we'll see what happens. We'll see if that animal walks again or not. Because in my experience, being in an academic center. I mean, there were a lot of surgeries that just didn't turn out well, same with TPLO. And that information doesn't necessarily filter down to the client who is desperate for somebody to help and to make a meaningful and help hopefully safe and effective approach. So what's the best way forward? Again, surgery can cause clinically significant spinal instability, especially when you're going to be taking out multiple spinal segments when you're going to be destabilizing things on multiple levels. Uh, and so here's a, a, a citation of that spinal instability resulting from bilateral mini hemilaminectomy and pediculectomy in 2009. Here's another one, 2012. Early reherniation of disc material in 11 dogs with surgically treated thoracolumbar intervertebral disc extrusion. Now keep in mind, as I mentioned, in terms of being a critical consumer of the literature when you go online shopping for free. And especially because when I've tackled with surgeons, when they've sat in my lectures at these meetings and just wait for my Q&A or they raise their hand in the middle, oh, how many studies do you have for acupuncture? And we talk about that. And it's like, how many cases are in your studies? You don't have 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, unless you're doing like an overall retrospective. When you're testing a procedure, you have really limited numbers of animals in your studies. And I'll tell you what, you do not have double blind placebo controlled surgeries 
even though you have told me, dear surgeons, that you do. And so it's like, yeah, we need to take you back to research 101 here. Anyway, this is from Veterinary Surgery 2012, this early reherniation of disc material in 11 dogs who've already had the surgery. So their objective was to report the findings and outcomes of dogs with reherniation of nuclear or disc material within seven days of hemilaminectomy for acute thoracolumbar intervertebral disc extrusion. And they had the chondrodystrophic dogs, 11 of them. This was a retrospective case series. The methods, they had dogs with acute neurologic decline within one week of surgical decompression. They had advanced imaging and 10 dogs, 10 of 11 dogs had a second decompressive surgery to remove extruded nuclear material Ooh, 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 ooh. So we not only paid many thousands of dollars for the surgery and for the advanced imaging, and I'll tell you what, there are a lot of dogs that don't come out well from the MRI, especially if it's a cervical, because they have this posture that their neck gets put in. Oftentimes they are pretty painful after the imaging. Anyway, so, oh, look, there's another disc right after surgery. We have to do all this again. Were you planning to pay your credit cards this month? Because I think you're going to have to get a new one. Anyway, results. All dogs had acute neurological deterioration two to seven days after initial hemilaminectomy. Bummer. Look, medical acupuncture, photobiomodulation, rational herbal therapy, medical massage, and also rational, careful rehabilitation does not give you a second disc herniation. Dogs that had a second surgical decompression improved neurologically within 24 hours and were paraparetic at discharge. Whew. So conclusion, early reherniation at the site of previous hemilaminectomy can produce acute deterioration of neurologic function and should be investigated with diagnostic imaging. Repeat decompressive surgery can lead to functional recovery. Yeah, for how long? And how long is it taking in your bank account to recover? Are people even going to do this? And then what? You're just going to leave them in a box for eight weeks? What's going to, what are, the, are they ever going to walk again? So risk of recurrence. Even after surgery, the rate of recurrence of neurologic signs and consequent euthanasia in dogs nears 50%. So you've got a little doctrine. You've sent them for surgery. And yeah, a lot of them go back. And the people say, we can't go through that again. According to one paper, dogs were euthanized for financial reasons or because the owners did not wish their pet to undergo a second surgery or have the potential for further recurrences. And that was in JAVMA 2004 on 265 cases. Recurrence of thoracolumbar intervertebral disc extrusion in chondrodystrophic dogs after surgical compression with or without prophylactic fenestration, 265 cases. Here, long-term outcome, again, JAVMA. 2012, long-term neurologic outcome of hemilaminectomy and disc fenestration for treatment of dogs with thoracolumbar intervertebral disc herniation. 831 cases. So they did a long retrospective over seven years. They wanted to determine the proportion of dogs that had herniation that successfully recovered after surgery and look at the time to ambulation and the frequency of urinary and fecal incontinence, because that can be a death sentence. Uh, and to document long-term complications. That's a noble approach, okay, 831 dogs. And just reassessed over three to six months, evaluation, looked at things. Okay, out of the 831 dogs, 122 had unsuccessful outcomes. You do the math, that's 15% of dogs that had surgery had unsuccessful outcomes. And then they're saying 709 had successful outcomes. But let's look, of 620 dogs that had intact deep pain before surgery, 97% were ambulatory after surgery. Despite maintaining the ability to walk, seven dogs were judged to have an unsuccessful outcome because the severity of ataxia did not improve. Of 211 paraplegic dogs with loss of deep pain, 110 dogs became ambulatory after surgery. Long-term complications included incontinence, permanent neurologic deterioration, and self-mutilation. Okay. So you might be able to get them walking again, as we do also with our integrative approaches. But dogs with paraplegia before surgery had a higher frequency of urinary or fecal incontinence compared with dogs that were ambulatory. So it's like, oh, well, if we can get you to walk at least for a little while, okay, we'll call that good. But what are they going to do with the permanent neurologic deterioration? It's only permanent because maybe they didn't have mechanisms to improve that and their incontinence. What did they do about it to say, oh, 
Bethanikoff, whatever. So we obviously have a situation here for those of you that need something to push back on surgeons when they say it's proven to be the gold standard, it's going to give you the best outcome. This is a paper that can give you more information. I'm only showing you the abstract because we only have a little bit of time. But we have to know that there are other options and that the whole story is not told by these papers on the just the long-term debility, the financial outcomes, and what else happened. So what does the literature say? In Vet Journal 2017, proportion, recovery, and times to ambulation for non-ambulatory dogs with TL disc disease treated with conservative approaches. We know that it's a common problem and that there are issues and data presented in this review support the current recommendations for surgical management of non-ambulatory dogs with disc extrusion, but only because they compared cases to cases and they say, Controlled clinical studies comparing outcomes are necessary to confirm these findings. They only looked at cases to cases. And who is it that are putting these papers together? Typically, often surgeons. Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine 2018, the comparison of surgical and conservative treatment of hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion in dogs. Remember, there's a whole potential for spontaneous regression of the disc material. So this was with whether compressive cervical myelopathy caused by the disc should be treated surgically or conventionally, conservatively, has been debated. Only one recent study contradicted these, but this idea about surgery, because again, this is a very pro-surgery profession. 18 of 36 dogs underwent surgery, where 18 dogs were managed conservatively, including cage rest, unfortunately, and physiotherapy. We don't know exactly what that consisted of. The most common affected disc space was C4, C5 with the neck or T13, L1 with the TL region. Medium time to regain ambulation was six days after surgery, 6.6 days after surgery, and 5.9 days with conservative management. So even shorter with conservative management, only the length of a potential intramedullary lesion in the neck had an influence on the prognosis to gain ambulatory status. So anyway, conclusion is conservative management of the extruded disc in the cervical as well as the TL region represents a reasonable alternative to surgery showing similar favorable outcomes. Note that, have that with you when you need to educate people, when you need to be there for yourself, when you need reassurance, and ultimately, When you are dealing with clients, this is where education is important, where we have to have the knowledge and command of the science and the mechanisms of action of our treatments against the mechanism of injury of what we're dealing with. And then we can show them, here's the evidence, you know, humans, they say do six weeks of conservative meaning non-surgical approaches, and then you could consider surgery. Surgery is always an option. We always, we have been brainwashed or cultivated to believe or whatever it is that, oh no, if there's any kind of disc there, it's going to be a permanent lesion. We must go in there very heroically, start scrubbing as soon as we hear somebody's coming, and we're going to be ready to cut right away. It's like, you know what? That thing could disappear by itself, and we have ways to improve the nervous system. So It's kind of a battle. So can we recognize issues before they become bigger problems? Yes, and that's where prevention comes in. That's where education about what to look for in the dog and cat and everybody. But if we look, okay, do I look normal? Yes, this dog looks normal, has a nice curvature of the back. What about this? Do I look normal? Showing this thoracolumbar kyphosis? No, not really. You are hunching up. You are showing evidence of some problems. This little guy says, I'm normal, aren't I? No, you're not sitting normally. And we see this hair coat cutoff here. So for those of you listening on podcast, you should watch the video because we're showing nice pictures now. This is not a normal way to sit. There's something going on there and at the lumbosacral region. This little girl here, very kyphotic. We have hair coat changes and your big brother there isn't so great either. We see the muscle tension and we see a hair coat change here. You just have to be taught how to look at these animals and you are not taught typically in vet school how to visually observe for changes in posture, for changes in function, and to be able to prevent things from happening, whether it's a joint disorder, cruise ship, or anything else, or the back. How can we keep them healthy? How do we keep them limber? What are the factors that go into spinal integrity and the maintenance thereof? So once things happen, though, the complexity of spinal cord injury 
it takes hold. So it would be great if we can see this early and if we can offset early issues with our interventions. But if it happens, you know, we have to get over this idea that we don't know what's going on because there is information. And that's what we will do for the rest of this webinar in terms of focusing multimodal approaches. We have that initial primary phase that happens after the injury. And then we have the secondary phase that starts pretty early on. But in the primary phase, you've got something mechanical that either endogenous, like a disc, or exogenous, car hits you. And you've got compression, contusion, laceration, shearing, and attraction of these neurons in the spinal cord. This will impact the assessment of your neurologic status and in the early phase. And it has been considered a strong prognostic indicator, but it's really the secondary injury that will define your long-term morbidity. So for you watching on video, this is my own development of uh, illustration of spinal cord, where this is the spinal cord here, and then we have meninges, the dura mater, arachnoid, and then pia mater. We have spinal arteries here that are important because when they get injured, then we're going to have compromise of oxygenation and ischemia. We have segmental arteries as well. And if we go in a parasagittal section like this, everything's just another walk in the park until we have an injury whether it's a disc coming in one direction or mechanical assault, hammering down on the spinal cord and causing interruption of the neurons. So we've got direct cell trauma to these neurons in the spinal cord, leading to potentially orthostatic and systemic hypotension, spinal shock, vasospasm, and cell injury leading to cell death and also ischemia and edema. So the hemorrhage will come in, that'll be like a space occupying lesion, We've got orthostatic or systemic hypotension. We've also got vasospasm, which is not going to be good for oxygen delivery to the cord. So we've got relative ischemia coming in, just choking off the blood supply, the ability for the situation to heal and recover and get nourishment through oxygen. And we've got edema, which itself will be the space occupying lesion, further causing compression of neuronal pathways. Then inflammatory cells infiltrate in the area and they have all kinds of cytokines and things that they're releasing. There is release of ATP from the cells and potassium, and that is hard on the tissue. After that gets cleaned up, and that's where, okay, if you're gonna do something surgically, that's where you're going to have an effect. But if you do something surgery, you are also participating in the secondary injury, which is a cascade of events that include vascular, cellular, and biochemical aspects to it. And it's the extent of the secondary injury that determines the greater extent of the damage, long-term morbidity, and the thwarting of restorative processes. So just think about what surgery is going to do on top of what has already happened. Another aspect of that is the release of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter that's going to just contribute to wind up. We're going to get pro-apoptotic signaling where the cells are just like, I've had it, just kill me now, I'm dead. And so there's going to be a die-off of the neurons. We get cell necrosis and just death of certain aspects. So where can we start to intervene, can start to think, what are the mechanisms of healing that I can impart for this individual? So we'll be getting to that. The subacute is just after the acute phase. We've got development and release of free radicals, excessive nitric oxide, noradrenaline, the ATP has spilled all over the place. We've got reduced ATP availability, which is necessary for the maintenance and recovery of things, invasion of immune cells, cytokine release, neurite growth inhibitory factors, and pertubal compression and spinal cord instability, potentially. But we see these first three things, the free radicals, the excessive nitric oxide, and neurotransmitters, reduced ATP availability. And we can think, wow, you know what? I'm thinking photomedicine here. I'm thinking that that's part of the mechanism of action that I can start to reverse. But look, this is a subacute phase. So if we want to prevent the demyelination of the surviving axons, the apoptosis, the initiation of the central cavitation, and the beginning of the astroglial scar, why didn't we intervene early with immediate photomedicine? So we can offset that loss of myelination, the neurons, the, the cyst producing, the syrinx potentially, the fibroblast infiltration, where we're getting connective tissue invading that neurologic area, producing a fibrous scar uh, with the release of the proteoglycans from those fibroblasts, which brings up the question, should you be administering polysulfated glycosamine and glycans to your patients with spinal cord injury? Even if they have arthritis, is that the best thing to do? And then the glial scar, the astrogliosis can sit in, the microglia, the immune system cells within the nervous system, they come in and they're just 
contributing to this inability of the neurons to rejoin if there's going to be a big inflammatory immune reaction there. As we move into the intermediate and chronic phase, we still have more of the same with the demyelination and et cetera, the alteration of ion channels and receptors. We have regenerative processes starting to happen with neuronal sprouting, but we also have this altered neurocircuitry because the neurons have not been prompted to work. We've kept the dog in a cage. We're not letting them walk. We're not doing the restorative support of rehab in a very conscious, rational manner. And then the acupuncture to send appropriate neural signaling through. So we end up with this glial or fibrin scar, attempting to remyelinate, but getting halted. They cannot grow. They're restricted. And then we've got the altered neurocircuitry and ion channels, which just makes mayhem of the information that has to go through that cord to make it improve. So with all that's happening, can we get from that down dog to a happy and restored dog without having this re-herniation and spinal cord instability? So how do we reverse the damage? and get a functional nervous system once again. We want to improve the tissue milieu to support the recovery, cultivate new neurons and glia that can actually make it to each other and restore that functional integrity with the new cells coming into the pre-existing neural tissue. How do we do that? We have to stimulate the substrate appropriately and we have many ways to do that. So when is it appropriate to begin implementing integrative medicine? Right away, start now. But if you have faculty, if you have clinicians, if you have an intern, if you have a resident, whoever it is that says, no, 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 we only can do surgery, keep them in a box, don't move them like this. (laughs) You mean we're going to do something else other than surgery? Uh, They can't maybe fathom, not that all surgeons are like that. Let's see where we might have made a difference if we took a more enlightened approach. Acute spinal cord injury where bone loss occurs rapidly and consistently after the spinal cord injury, leading to decreased bone mineral density and higher risk of fractures, what can be done there? Oh, photobiomodulation. Low-level laser therapy accelerates bone healing in spinal cord injured rats. Sad for the rats, but we have evidence. The results suggest that laser therapy accelerated the process of bone repair in rats with complete spinal cord injury. Complete spinal cord injury. Usually in the dog, it's not complete. This is complete in the rat experimentally induced. So we have the acute spinal cord injury features, the hypotension, the shock, the vasospasm, the ischemia, and all that. What can we do? Oh, vasospasm. We can treat that with lasers. The effects of transcranial, another central nervous system structure, transcranial LED therapy on cerebral blood flow in elderly women, light-induced vasodilation of coronary arteries and its possible clinical implication. Vessels respond to photobiomodulation to relax you know, which gives you better blood flow. With acupuncture, intensive vasodilation in the sciatic pain area after dry needling. The effect of transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation of sympathetic anglions and acupuncture points on distal blood flow. The mechanisms are clear. They're neuromodulatory. What about orthostatic hypotension? Laser applications in plastic and reconstructive surgery. So laser therapy for plastic surgery includes pain attenuation, wound healing acceleration, enhanced remodeling and accelerated bone and tendon repair restoration of normal neural function, normalization of abnormal hormonal function, modulation of the autoimmune system, think glial scar, think the astroglite, the gliosis, control of hyper and hypotension, and so on. Is this too simple? Is it too cheap? Is it too, you know, meaning in, inexpensive? Is it too um, patient empowering, client empowering? Why aren't these things standard of care? They need to be. New standard of care starting today. Electroacupuncture ameliorates the coronary occlusion-related tachycardia and hypotension in acute rat myocardial ischemia models. So again, dealing with the hypotension, we want to have appropriate blood pressure so that we can get blood to where it needs to be. Hemodynamic stability in cervical spinal cord trauma patient with acupuncture. Then we have the edema, the inflammatory cell infiltrate that happens you know, as a consequence of the injury. Oh, photobiomodulation, because I'm just taking these two out of the whole gamut of things we could be talking about. But let's just talk about acupuncture and photomedicine. Effects of laser phototherapy on wound healing following a cerebral ischemia by cryogenic injury experimental. Laser phototherapy emerges as an alternative auxiliary therapy for acute ischemic stroke, traumatic brain injury, degenerative brain disease, spinal cord injury, and peripheral nerve regeneration. But its effects are still controversial. We have previously found that the laser phototherapy immunomodulates the response to focal brain damage. So 
you know, they're, they're, a lot of times they say, oh, there hasn't been enough research and then uh, that's why we're doing it. When you can really see when you go back, there's quite more research than you would have even expected. The gist of this is they're treating edema with laser photomedicine. Electroacupuncture at acupoints of the governor vessel, which is dorsal midline acupuncture channel in rats with experimental spinal cord injury. So relieving edema of the spinal cord with this acupuncture. Acupuncture mediated inhibition of inflammation facilitates significant functional recovery after spinal cord injury in neurobiologic disease 2010. What about the release of glutamate? Low level laser therapy protects primary cortical neurons against excitotoxicity in vitro. Glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter, these end the MDA receptors. Excitotoxicity describes a pathogenic process whereby the deaths of neurons releases large amounts of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, which then proceeds to activate a set of glutamatergic receptors on neighboring neurons, glutamate, NMDA, and kinate opening ion channels leading to an influx of calcium ions producing mitochondrial dysfunction and cell death. Remember apoptosis. So here we have the means by which to counteract that glutamate, glutamatergic neurotoxicity and take down spinal cord windup. Excitotoxicity contributes to brain damage after stroke, traumatic brain injury, and neurodegenerative diseases, and is also involved in spinal cord injury. Then they talk about their approach with the laser therapy, produces ATP, remember that was a deficit, raising mitochondrial membrane potential, reducing intracellular calcium concentrations, which is important in terms of this neurotoxicity, excitotoxicity, reducing oxidative stress. Remember there was oxidative stress, there wasn't enough blood flow and oxygen coming in there and reducing nitric oxide, just all those changes from that ischemia and inflammation. The action of laser in abrogating excitotoxicity may play a role in explaining its beneficial effects in diverse central nervous system pathologies. Should become a first line procedure and would it and is in my book. Whenever we have people that graduate and that's the first thing they do and that's the reason for our Prima program, PDM Prima and the graduate Prima where people are learning the diversity of techniques that they need to institute to make these meaningful differences come to life, come to the fore in the actual clinic environment. More research, the regulatory effect of electroacupuncture on the expression of NMDA receptors in a spinal cord injured rat model. So showing how we can wind down the spinal cord with electroacupuncture, preferentially get it early, but if you don't, at least get it in there. Chronic spinal cord injury, major features. We went through this in the altered neurocircuitry, for photomedicine, light promotes regeneration and functional recovery and alters the immune response after spinal cord injury. That's from lasers and surgery in medicine. The photobiomodulation with 6% power penetration to the spinal cord depth significantly increased axonal number and distance of regrowth. Photobiomodulation also returned aspects of function to baseline levels and significantly suppressed immune cell activation and cytokine chemokine expression. Again, I just ask you, are you learning this in school? If not, why not? Our results demonstrate that light delivered transcutaneously, so no need to cut into things, make them unstable, improves recovery after injury and suggests that light will be a useful treatment for human spinal cord injury. Canine studies, this is one just out in April 25th, 2020, BMC Veterinary Research. Perilesional photobiomodulation therapy and physical rehabilitation in postoperative recovery of dogs surgically treated for thoracolumbar disc extrusion. So this, they're still postoperative, unfortunately. Think what would happen if they weren't, and we can just get in there without that added trauma of surgery. We don't know. We need studies. Is that added trauma of surgery worth it or not when you have everything else brought to bear? What we do see is that when people can't afford it or they decline it, we see animals anecdotally, but lots of them in our community that are getting up and walking again fairly quickly without all that added expense and trauma of the surgery and maybe the second surgery because another disc herniated. So 24 dogs included in this study treated with laser therapy and rehab and 12 dogs. So half and half, some received rehab and laser, some received just rehab. All dogs treated with laser therapy showed improved neurologic status if deep nociception, deep pain on admission was maintained. So the use of laser therapy in the post-op rehabilitation of dogs affected by laser and submitted to surgery for surgical decompression could help the neurologic status because there was a tendency for a shorter mean time of days in the laser group versus the no laser therapy group to regain ambulation.
acupuncture in dogs with intervertebral disc disease. This is, I believe it's a study from Korea. B venom injections, which is just an alpha-2 agonist where it's acupuncture in a way to put into the acupuncture points, looking for it for TL disc disease in dogs, randomized controlled prospective trial. They say B venom injection exerted a particularly strong effect on canines with moderate to severe intervertebral disc disease and dramatically reduced clinical rehabilitation time. Another study comparing decompressive surgery, electroacupuncture, and decompressive surgery followed by electroacupuncture for the treatment of dogs with intervertebral disc disease with longstanding severe neurologic deficits. That's from JAVMA 2010. They concluded electroacupuncture was more effective than decompressive surgery for the recovery of ambulation and the improvement in neurologic deficits in dogs with longstanding severe deficits attributable to TL disc disease. This was a retrospective study. However, this was not a prospective study. And this is Hayashi et al. Evaluation of electroacupuncture treatment for dogs with TL disc disease, JAVMA 2007. They said electroacupuncture combined with standard Western medical treatment was effective and resulted in shorter time to recover ambulation and deep pain perception than did use of Western treatment alone in dogs with signs of thoracolumbar disc disease. And so much more to cover. So effects of acupuncture and photobiomodulation on endogenous and implanted stem cells should be studied on peripheral nerve health, muscle tissue, bowel and bladder function, skin ulceration, chronic pain, sensory or motor dysfunction. There's so much more to cover, but I'm just giving you a little slice here because there's more information out there and there's just more integration that needs to happen. There's also the neuroprotection and analgesic effects of cannabis. We didn't even touch on that. And then the multiple benefits of medical massage, not to mention what you're doing for people's hearts uh, because you are offering them something else. And they don't have to be intimidated, but they can be a partner in this animal's recovery and they don't have to be scared and they don't have to put the dog down if they can't afford it. So they can go step by step, literally and figuratively. So with so much more to cover, join us for more in-depth information on the treatment of spinal cord injury in our other CuraCore online courses. We've touched on things, we've talked about acupuncture and mechanisms thereof and of cannabis and so on in our the webinars some that have been transferred to podcasts, additional reading if you'd like. There's Beyond the Laboratory. This is an invited editorial I did for photomedicine and laser surgery back in 2017. Beyond the Laboratory, Into the Clinic, What Dogs with Disc Disease Have Taught Us About Photobiomodulation for Spinal Cord Injury Implicating in Humans. And then here's a, another reading, 2018, Topics in Companion Animal Medicine, Veterinary Neurologic Rehabilitation, the Rationale for a Comprehensive Approach. And as they say, although the primary neurologic disorders research tend to be spinal cord injury and so on, can be how we can apply them to veterinary neurologic disorders, there's limited research. And so they're just talking about physical therapy has been the standard of care for patients with neurologic injury in human medicine for decades, whereas similar rehabilitation techniques have only recently been adapted and utilized in veterinary medicine. And talking about the common problem of spinal cord injury in dogs and all that, of particular interest to clients and veterinarians are techniques and modalities used to promote functional recovery after neurologic injury, which can mean the difference between life and death for many veterinary patients. And when your animal goes your life has changed forever and you still have to foot the bill. So the trend in human neurologic rehabilitation, often regardless of etiology, is a multimodal approach to therapy. So why are surgeons just saying, I mean, I've, I've had surgeons in an academic environment withhold pain medicine after surgery saying, well, I took the disc out. That was the problem. That was the cause of pain. I mean, this was such an unethical thing that should have been reported to the board, but say, oh, well, he's going to be moving on in a few weeks. So we're not going to, we're not going to rock the boat. Anyway, moving on. So yeah, evidence supports faster and improved recoveries in people after neurologic injury using a combination of rehabilitation techniques. And so how are we going to work with animals? And as they say in this paper, Studies, both laboratory and clinical, support the use of acupuncture in the management of neurologic conditions in small animals, specifically in cases of intervertebral disc disease, other myelopathies, and neuropathic pain conditions. Acupuncture's ability to promote analgesia, stimulate trophic factors, and decrease inflammation, including neuroinflammation, make it an alluring adjunct therapy after neurologic injury. So, and just talking also about laser and rehab. 
Accordingly, due to the relative lack of evidence-based studies in veterinary neurologic rehabilitation, much of the data available is human or laboratory animal-based. We're getting more dog, I, you, I just showed you some of the dog studies, clinical. However, evidence supports the utilization of an early comprehensive treatment protocol for optimal neurologic recovery. So get your hands, even on this abstract, read this, take it into your practice, be able to defend what you do as a science-based integrative medicine and rehab practitioner. Give people options. The rationale for why an integrative approach is critical. <sighs> so words for the journey. If you are in veterinary school currently, and if your faculty is not supportive of science-based integrative medicine, remember your options and resources. Zoom us in. Get me to speak there for your faculty and students this is what I do all the time. Have those skeptics be there in the front row. They can give me questions in advance or ask me on the spot. I am ready for them. I've done this before. Enroll in PVM Prima, our professional veterinary medical curriculum, which is the pain, rehab, and integrative medicine advantage program. It's a vertically and horizontally integrated curriculum. It's about 10 to 15 to 20 hours of online instruction and remote laboratory engagement per year, per academic year. So you can do this, but it will help you fill in the blanks as you go, as you learn things. That's the vertical and horizontal integration. Consult the literature to make your case. I've already shown you a plethora of things, and there is so much joy in online shopping for free articles. And review our Wednesday webinar recordings and podcasts. So get in touch. We are here for you. This is what we do. This is why we do it because we care about animals and their appropriate care and your mental health as a caregiver so that you can give options and you're not euthanizing animals where they don't have to be. You're giving people the ability to intervene on their animal's behalf with meaningful clinical measures. So you can email us at info at curacore.org. You can reach me personally at narda at curacore.org. And that's the story. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for being here. And, uh, Appreciate you joining us. See you next time.